All right. So, uh, oh, wow, look at that. The iguana is making an appearance. I don't know that if it's already had to make the appearance, but it certainly is this afternoon in Portland. All right, so up to PPM 38, uh, originally written on the 22nd day of, um, of March 2004. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I, I grabbed a copy of the book um, off my shelf, being a learning. Because I was interested to see where I was in terms of the correspondence between the originally written meditations and um, and the book, the final copy. And um, in fact, we're now into chapter three. So the movement, I kept saying that, that there was this shift from Socrates. Well, that's because we now were moving into the chapter three called the Way of Lao Tzu. So all this discussion of the sage is from... Um, uh, chapter 3 and I guess that at this point maybe what I'll start doing is and when I uh, do the the uh, the typing up of the blog entry I'll sort of situate people who might be following along with the book that we're now into page let's see oh there we are we're on page 60 in the book so there we are, page 60 of the book. All right, so we're in the middle of talking about in chapter 3 um, on Lao Tzu. So, yeah, in the last meditation we were talking about, um, and the focus was the um, formation of the of what I call the intentional community. Well, not what I called it, but I, uh, I made mention, I think it was Roxanne uh, uh, the Forges who made this point in, during the conference. Um, but discussion of the sage as leading a philosophy that is a, a wandering philosophy that takes us away from the domestic um, and out into the wild, so to speak, and that it offers up a kind of destruction of, um, in the sense of deconstruction, of uh, domestic philosophy. So here we go, uh, on to the next meditation. When we say that the sage gets wandering underway, and is thereby an initiator, one who begins, a beginner, we refer to the sage as the teacher, or one who offers the gift of teachability. To receive this gift is to be turned around. Teaching means to let learning happen. But to let learning happen, the teacher must be reposed to receive the saying of the apprentice as other. Learning happens when the learner learns. And this learning is expressed first and foremost as a response to the call to learn. Some speak of the call to teach, and above all, we have said that evocative speech is a call, a calling that turns. So as the sage draws out apprentices with the evocative first questions that repose the learner as learner, as the let me start that again. So as the sage draws out apprentices with evocative first questions that repose the learner as learner, as the call to him to learn, so too the sage, if she is going to be a teacher and must be more teachable than the apprentices, undertakes her teaching as a reception of the response to, to the call to learn. This give and take is the poetic dialogue that represents the processual unfolding of learning. This processual unfolding, insofar as it is, an emerging, it is emerging as a twofold play of offering and reception, Saying and hearing, acting and spectating, expresses the twofold play of being. Thus, poetic dialogue locates us in the proper abode, which we find in our relationship with being. To learn is to find oneself in the ecstatic abode of existence, which designates our belongingness to being. Learning as the manifestation of a primordial thinking, a thinking together, or a being with, brings forth the relatedness of the disparate members of the horizon of beings. The disparate parts are recollected as a unified field that appear together. Learning is re-collective thinking. Quote, such thinking is, insofar as it is, a recollection of being and nothing else. It's a quote from Heidegger. There exists then a call to learn that is more originary than the call to teach. 
Before, during, and after so-called teaching is the more originary call received from being. This original call, as we have seen and will discuss further, is the tidings that gets the sage underway and sustains her movement, her journey. This is yet another dimension of the twofold play. Learning is unfolding both in the recollection of beings, in the relatedness, and in the recollection of beings with being. If learning unfolds from the twofold play of repose and reposing, then this event is always already occurring within the ultimate context of the, of the beyond, the nothing, and moving along the way, Tao. Beings are always related to and situated within this ultimate context, which emerges as the wholly unknowable, yet necessary condition for the possibility of making meaning. The beyond, as nameless, calls out, and in receiving this call, we are put underway, and in the process, raise unanswerable yet urgent questions. These ultimate questions, freedom, immortality, and God, are asked as a response to the call of the nameless. Who are you? Where are you? Are exemplars of the originary questions that signify the way of learning. When we are put under way as apprentices, we find ourselves estranged from ourselves because our habitual habitat has been dismantled, or we have been drawn out of the most familiar abode. But we are welcomed by our new neighbor, who we do not yet know. So Heraclitus says, quote, the familiar abode for man is the open region for the presencing of God, the unfamiliar one. The togetherness of wandering is a necessary outcome. Learning is an authentic recollection of our being, of our being relatedness. To be recollected is to be brought together again, and this means to be recalled. To be recalled is to be called again, and this suggests that we are called back to rejoin something we have already been doing. Learning is to partake in an event we have always already not yet been doing. As Arendt noted, this is the peculiar modality of thinking, from which it follows that the business of thinking is like Penelope's web. It undoes every morning what it has finished the night before. For the need to think can never be stilled by allegedly definite insights of wise men. It can be satisfied only through thinking, and the thoughts I had yesterday will satisfy this need today only to the extent that I want and am able to think them anew. What Arendt could have emphasized is her important insight into the inconclusive, ongoing journey of thinking, which is spurred on, on by an urgent need and desire, is the extent to which the wise people, the sages, while they do not satisfy the apprentice's desire, they certainly do play a crucial role in enabling them to both undo and reweave thinking. Indeed, the webs of meaning that are weaved signify the connections made between those who participate in poetic dialogue in learning and teaching. The journey is not solitary, but collective, one undertaken with others. It is the alterity of the ultra that makes it possible to think anew, and the role of the sage is to let this thinking happen. In order for our thinking to be renewed, it must be received and interpretable, stand out as questionable and reposed. Only when it passes over the abyss of possibility can it be heard anew. The exchanges of poetic sayings weave the webs of meaning that are weaved and unweaved. Together, these webs we weave and unweave together cultivate a community, a philosophy of the people. That's how it ends. So um, at the end, I kind of come back to this, this trope of the philosophy of the people to emphasize the sense in which um, the, the philosophical enterprise that I'm, I'm uh, sort of addressing and, and, and taking up here, uh, paradoxically, in the you know, solitary confines of my study where I'm speaking to the camera and hoping that, you know, like when I do the radio, that someone is going to pick it up and, and, and do something with it, listen to it and do something with it. So it's paradoxical, as well as when I did the original experiment, I was just writing there. Um, but the gesture, as Arendt actually said, is, you know, towards the other. So the writing, while I was writing in, in, in the sort of solitary confines of my study and making these records, records and archives of this reading in the solitary confines of my study, this in particular with this video making and the blogging is really a gesture towards others. It's what uh, Sam Rochich calls an offering. 
So what I'm trying to emphasize here at the end is that you know a rent is absolutely helpful here. When she uh, with her site with her quotation here, where she talks about thinking uh, that is being like Penelope's web, where she you know Penelope uh, um, the faithful uh, patient uh, uh, wife of Ulysses who waited um, for his return uh, while the suitors were were waiting for her to give up. Uh, and he, she w was saying, you know, I'll, I'll be ready when my when my um, uh, when my tapestry um, uh, uh, that she was working on on the, on the uh, that she was weaving is completed. But she never completed it because she would work on it all day long, and they thought, okay, she's hard at work, and then she would unweave it. Um, so f for a rent, this is like the powerful metaphor for what she calls the business of thinking. It has no progress actually to it, right? Um, it has to begin again every day. It has to begin anew. I mean, the, the modality of thinking that I read, I've really sort of taken this from her and learned this from her, is powerfully what she calls the sheer activity of thinking, which is it just it dwells and emerges and happens in this place of spontaneity, but also in this place of novelty. It, it, it emerges from what she calls the human condition from natality. And this is why, ultimately, I will call this ceaseless nativity. Because it's the taking on and the being within beings presencing. So we think like this because this is the way in which being is, right? So that if I have like a fundamental sort of metaphysical definition of being, it is in term, these terms of uh, ceaseless nativer, nativity. Uh, it's the, it's it's like a, the quasar, right, in the cosmic uh, uh, physics language of of of, of um, you know the notion that there is this possibly on the other side of a black hole, which I'm not going to go there now, is this quasar, this sort of bursting forward of, of energy, right, and that's ceaseless, that's, that seems to be eternal. Um, it's one of the reasons why I quoted Heraclitus, right, because, you know, she, he, he, the translation anyway is uh, God, but it's uh, the familiar abode for man is the open region for the presencing of God, the unfamiliar one. So um, it's this play of familiar, and unfamiliar. Um, so, so here's the point is, is that um, that's all sort of naming our being and learning as this relationship with being. So we're learning, capital L, when we are in the modality where we are in the midst of this, this presencing of being. And this is the, the moment where we're turned towards learning with a small l, which is thinking, right, in the way that Arendt is talking about it, which um, always begins anew. So it's a sort of mimesis, right? So we are uh, uh, mimicking or copying or replicating being's way, right? So that's why I talked about it using Lao Tzu's language, um, that when we are being, when we're on the way, the Tao is one word for the way, we are on the way of being. That is to say that we're, we're following the way. So another way of talking about mimesis is to say that we're following the way of being. And so learning with the small l that emerges through philosophy, and again, philosophy is I'm describing it as this wide, uh, very general sense in which we make things that we offer up to others. Um, music, writing, poetry, painting, all these, w all these ways in which we are making something that's singular and unique, right? So the singularity and the particularity of each and every one of us that comes through in thinking slash in philosophy has to be something like a work of art, right? So it's not anything that can be uh, duplicated or anything that can be replicated, uh, could not be manufactured. So it's the aura of the singular, to use uh, Walter Benjamin's language. And then yet we share, we offer, because so it has a worldly existence, right? So it becomes into the world, our singularity comes into the world with this offering that we make, and it gets picked up by others. Right, so these videos or the writing, the books, all these different ways in which we we bring something into the world that is an expression of our singularity, a manifestation of our learning. We talked about this in the dialogue with Tyson Lewis, and then we offer it and share it with others. But this is what's important. This is what I tried to sort of not correct Arendt on, but extend Arendt's point that it's in this worldly manifestation of our thinking. Uh, that we recognize our relationship with others, right? That we are interwoven with one another. Uh, and so that we aren't just writing or, or playing music for the sake of doing it, but we're actually putting something out there uh, that we share with others. And so that fa Arendt's famous formula about the public sphere being the place where we can see others in their singularity and be seen 
in our singularity and that we can hear others in their singularity and that we are heard in our singularity and that that relationship creates plurality. In the same way, I want to suggest that what, what is it that we are saying and what is it that we are hearing? Well, what we're saying and hearing is, I, I want to say, philosophy in this very general sense. And it requires then that the meaning or the facticity, not so much the meaning as what it means, but its facticity, its material, its, its existence, right? It's, it's reality. And Arendt is very keen on this sense, you know, for her, you know, well, I won't go there right now, but the sense of in which there's a reality of the worldly, there's a facticity, a worldly reality. It's very important that we can all share in, right? What she calls the res publica, the, the thing that we share in common. That, that, that this is the, the key for understanding the significance of learning as I'm describing it. That it has this worldly manifestation that brings us together. Right? She, Arendt says, that which brings us together also separates us, but separates us insofar as we can remain uh, in our you know, singularity and particularity, and everyone can recognize that. But all that points to the sense in which we are in a sort of collectivity. Right? So the philosophy of a people, then, to talk about it, uh, the philosophy of a people is to mean philosophy is the shared event. Right? And this is why, for me, again, it just resonates with the language of education. It resonates with the language of learning uh, community. It just, 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 just captures the sense in which we're engaged in something together. Right? And in this sense, it's a philosophy of the people. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to try to keep this one a, uh, a bit uh, uh, on you know, uh, brevity. I'm going to work with brevity and you know, still 16 minutes, but uh, onward and, and forward. And again, if you're um, following along <laughs> and being learning the final publication, this uh, what I originally wrote today on the uh, 22nd day of March 2004 and read today on the 22nd of March 2014 was uh, about pages 60 to 61 and being and learning.